Arthur Daly, the sports columnist, said that golf is like a love affair. If you don't take it seriously, it's not any fun. If you do take it seriously, it will break your heart. Well, the sport of golf continues to grow in popularity, and more and more enthusiasts are looking for ways to improve their golfing skills while still enjoying the great fun that chasing that tiny little ball around a course has to offer. Here to talk about just that is Michael Robichard, PGA professional and manager of the Ranch Golf Club in Southwick, Massachusetts. Welcome, Michael. Hello, how are you? Uh, I'm so happy to have you here. The The Ranch Golf Club is relatively new. Yes, we opened uh, in July 2001. Uh, it's a daily fee upscale course. Um, we actually were ranked the third best new upscale course in the country by Golf Digest in 2002 and uh, ranked uh, in the best in the state in Massachusetts. So it's a great property, a beautiful, unique property. Um, it is an old uh, New England dairy farm with uh, three beautiful Victorian barns that we've um, renovated into our clubhouse complex, and uh, it's a beautiful experience. Definitely a must-visit for golfers. Yeah. So, Mike, you have worked with a lot of golfers of varied skill levels. Is it possible to take the game seriously and still have a good time out there? <laughs> yes, uh, but it's an easy game to get caught up into, uh, you know, um, many different uh, uh, stressful ways of, of trying to get better. But it, like in any sport, is you just have to, you know, probably get it down to its simplest form, um, understand the concept first, learn the basics, and try to stick to them as much as possible. Uh, but like a lot of sports, particularly in golf, you know, there are a lot of gimmicks out there, there are a lot of things, but I really think if somebody finds a mentor or a professional that they have a, a comfortable relationship with, that they can communicate well with and, and, and really feel comfortable with, that, you know, those, those basics will be learned and the concept will be one that will never be lost. Uh, the bottom line is, is you know, is, as teachers, we just want to teach the student that it's great to, to get better, and there are many ways to get better, but ultimately you just have to have fun playing. It is a game, um, and, uh, you know, let the, the childlike um, personality come out of you and just enjoy it as a game. And that's why we're out there for fun. Okay, well, we are going to talk a little bit about the instructor-student relationship a little later on, but if I came to you today and said I wanted to start playing, how would you go about getting me started? Well, um, I certainly would set up a series of, of um, sessions and clinics, and that first clinic is um, really more informative. I think, um, you know, when someone uh, comes to the game new, uh, to put a club in their hand and start talking about hitting the ball, uh, that's really not what golf is. Uh, yes, you do have to hit the ball, but the game is a bigger picture. It's a lot like life. You can't focus on the little. And so I would probably take the day and drive the person around the golf course just to show them what a course is, explain to them, you know, the, just the basics of the game, uh, how you're trying to score, and, and uh, you know, I wouldn't get too deep into the rules, but talk a lot about the traditions and etiquette because there is um, a certain manner in which you have to act in golf. It, it is a game of tradition and, and etiquette and everything. And the whole thing in that introduction is to get that person comfortable and say, oh, yeah, I think I understand that. Because I think that is daunting to a lot of first-time players is just, you know, what do you do? Where do you, where do you take the cart? And, you know, just the, the etiquette, that's so important that you brought that up. Yeah, I think I've found through my experience and a lot of my fellow professionals have found that, you know, to start a beginning student off by just hitting a, a club um, is very frustrating because when they get on the golf course, they really don't know what to do with it. They don't get the concept of the game. And anything uh, in, in that you're trying to learn, I think the student has to understand the concept first before they feel comfortable. And game, you know, golf is a sport, and you can't perform any sport unless not only you feel comfortable, but you have a certain level of confidence. Mm -hmm. And so you really, from the first lesson, I'm trying to build confidence in the student that they understand what they're trying to do in every step of the way. So get out there and learn the fundamentals before you try to play. You know, I start a lot of my beginners off not with hitting a full swing, but with putting. Mm. Because, you know, the, the, the swing is a pendulum stroke, and, and really uh, the basics of setup and stance and ball position start with putting, and, and they just kind of grow and evolve from that. So uh, everybody can putt. Most people have gone to a you know, miniature golf course, and right. they've putted, and they've tried that. So, you know, they're already starting off with someone they're familiar with, and that, that might build the momentum to want to learn more. And, you know, the key is not to lose a student. 
Right, and, right. And to get them to say, wow, I can do that. Now, well, so the next thing is chipping. And chipping is just a little more swing than putting. But now you've got a game because you're hitting the ball with one club onto the green and then taking the putter and putting it in. Now you're teaching how to play and how to score. Okay, let's talk a little bit about equipment. Um, how important is club fitting? I mean, can you just start with some, some equipment that you may have borrowed in the beginning, or do you need to actually have clubs fitted to you? I, I personally believe the single um, uh, greatest reason that people do not play to their potential is because they don't have properly fitted equipment. Mm. Um, you know, the technology out there today can make the game so easy, but there's, you know... The, You buy a set of clubs off the rack, and you're really buying something that fits 15% of the population. Um, Now, not that there has to be great variances, but most of the PGA professionals out there today have some type of fitting system that they can get you fit into the right the right one. And most of the manufacturers have it out there. So I do believe that you know there's a great opportunity for people to get fit right off the bat, and particularly at the beginning, to, you know, to get an old set of clubs that are the wrong weight and the wrong length and the wrong shaft, and then to try to learn the game. Well, there's not going to be a lot of positive results out of that if it doesn't work. So right sense. from the get-go, I think you need to give yourself every opportunity. I mean, would you go and, and learn how to play baseball if you're a left-handed but use a right-handed glove? Mm. You've got the wrong equipment to do the job. Good point. So, you know, if you're going to play golf, I think there is some investment there. There are various levels of of um, investment that you can make, but you can find something, I think people can find something that fits into their means to get at least something reasonably close to what they need because it's just going to make them that much successful sooner. Where can we go to find the equipment? Can you recommend, you know, obviously they can come to a pro at a club and, and purchase equipment. Are there other places that you could recommend? Yeah, there's, there's you know, um, golf clubs, most public golf courses, uh, if you're not a member of a private club, of course, if it's a private club, they can go there. Um, and, and, you know, I, I really just, the people that are trained in this industry to fit golf the best are the PGA professionals. There are PGA professionals that work in various retail sites. Just call the retail site if they sell golf and say, do you have a PGA professional on board? Okay. If they don't, then you can find one. I know there's uh, several uh, sporting goods stores out there that do have PGA professionals. And there's other um, golf specific stores around that people can go to and and find someone that can fit them correctly. Okay. All right. Let's move on to the more experienced player. Now, are there common problems or bad habits that mid to higher uh, handicaps come to you to correct? You know, um, depending on on the level, let's start with the low, low handicap. The better players, they're just looking to get fine-tuned, you know, and, and that's really what people want to get to is actually get back to what we were saying in the beginning. They only want to know, is my grip okay? How's my stance look? How's my posture? They don't want to talk about the swing because they know that's an athletic response. Mm-hmm. Um, and I try not to do too much swing mechanics in any of my teaching at any level. I'll find ways for people to feel it so that they can practice it. But So that the beginner is really looking, you know, how's, my, how, how's things looking, you know, as far as that. They'll probably... W- want just somebody there to make them feel good and build up that confidence and have an opportunity to, uh, you know, at least build confidence that they're doing the basics correct, and and everything comes at it from there. Um, As I get into someone who's a little higher handicapper, I'm using drills or a lot of practice swings or different things to get them to feel uh, that uh, what they're trying to feel because generally when a person is having a difficult time, they're thinking about too much mechanics and they're not just letting the athletic, um, you know, response happen. Okay. Why don't we go back and talk a little bit about, even though it is hard to describe just in an audio situation, but can you describe the perfect grip? Yeah, I could. I think I can. Uh, the, the, the top hand, uh, which is the left hand for a right-handed person and the right hand for a left-handed person. Um, ideally, what you're trying to do is get your palms to face each other while you're holding this golf club. And the position of the top hand is really critical that should actually control the position of the club face. So if a person were to put the club down, and you'd have to know what a square club face looks like, meaning you know, that face would be aiming at its target. Okay. And if it's sitting properly, you're going to let your arm hang down from your side and then bring your hand to the, to the handle and just close the last three fingers. That's the grip pressure. That's the pressure is only in those last three fingers. 
And at that point, you're going to let the top of your hand relax so that the thumb goes, and for a right-handed person, to the right-hand side of the um, uh, right side of center on the shaft. You form a V with your thumb and forefinger, and that should be pointing up to your right shoulder. Your right hand, you're going to place the ring and middle finger on the shaft, and the baby finger is something that's a real individual thing. Some people like to interlock the baby finger with the other hand's ring finger. Some overlap some baseball grip. It's a matter of preference. There's no one that's better than the other. I can give you examples of players that, you know, with all the variation of those grips that have, that have won major championships. Uh, Tiger Woods uses an overlap. Jack Nicklaus was an interlock. I mean, they're the greatest players that ever lived. So there's no one way better than the other. It's a personal thing. It's all whatever's um, comfortable to you. Yeah, yeah, and so when you do is just make sure when, the, when you're grabbing with the right hand that once you close those two fingers, you can feel the palms facing each other. At that point, you'll stick your arms out after you close your right hand around, and you'll point a, the V with the, the thumb and forefinger of your right hand will also go towards your right shoulder. And if you were to pick the club up and put your arms out in front of you, that club face would be square. If it's off one way or the other, then your hands aren't in the right position. And that's about, I hope I could articulate that well enough. That was excellent. <laughs> you can visualize it. I, so. I was visualizing it as you said it. Now, maybe you could tell us a little bit about the stance and posture that is necessary for a good golf swing posture is pretty uh pretty basic to any athletic thing that you're getting ready for um the big thing is the width of stance uh, we like to tell people keep your feet the width of your about the width of where your hip joints are those are pivot points you it, it, this is a static um action that you're you're creating the motion so that the, the the, you know, the machine or the body has to be in balance. You need to have your feet underneath your pivot points. Um, so about the width of your hips. Teachers used to say the width of your shoulders. Um, the problem is most guys think their shoulders are like, you know, Franco Harris of the Pittsburgh Steelers, too big. <laughs> and they end up putting their feet apart too wide. So about the width of hip, just so the balls of your feet are under the sockets of your hips. That's the best, um, you know, place to be in balance. Um, your body should be in a position similar to somebody who's, uh, in particular the lower body, we'll talk from the waist down, um, somebody who's getting ready to shoot a foul shot or maybe a shortstop waiting, you know, they're in that bouncy kind of mode, but the knees are flexed, but they're not bent and, and sort of in a sit-down position. The lower body has to be ready to, better, ready to react. It's almost like throwing a ball. You're going to go one way and wind up and then let it go and get off that backside and go forward. Uh, it's like a, a lot of my students when we're watching football season, we'll talk and, you know, if they're hanging back, you see some quarterbacks that hang off their back foot. They have no power, but when they get off their back foot, they have power. So that's what you're trying to do in golf is get off your back foot on the forward swing. And then the spine angle, your spine should be fairly uh, straight and at an angle of about 15 degrees tilted towards the ground. Any slumping or any more than that, then, you know, we don't get the big muscles to work the way they want to. Okay. So the body sort of has a 15-degree angle of the spine. Then from the hips, there's a little bending of the knees, and then the feet are right below the, the balls of the, um, the, the balls of the feet are right above the hip joints, and the shoulders are right above the hips also. So there's you really set up where you get the shoulders, hips, and, and balls of your feet in the same thing, so there's balance. Any leaning forward out of balance or back out of balance, then you're going to be fighting balance throughout the whole swing, and that's not something you want to do in sport. You want to just let it be kind of natural. Now, I think those are good reminders for beginner golfers or more advanced golfers, because I'm sure, you know, we, we tend to fall back into our bad habits, and, you know, just being reminded of those technical things are important which which comes to when you're what i teach a lot of my students that if you watch the, the touring pros on tv on a sunday and watch every shot you'll notice they go through a certain routine and those pre-shot routines mm. have elements in them that allow them to have a checklist of all of the basics first a player will take the club out of the, the bag and go behind the golf ball putting the ball between them and the target what they're doing there for, is visualizing what they want to do. Not from a swing standpoint, but show me the flight of the ball, get some feedback, your body will react to get that, and they're just kind of visualizing maybe a nice smooth swing or something. The next thing they'll do is they'll put their hands on the glove, and a lot of them will be very particular to practice the right grip. 
Then they'll put the club face down so it's aiming towards the target. That's aim. Then they'll bring their body around and spread their feet apart to the right distance and put the ball in the right position. And they'll be kind of getting themselves. And they'll waggle the club a little bit. And then they'll take a couple of looks at the target, going back to visualization, and then they'll turn the key and swing. So there's six or seven steps in there where they're always checking the basic fundamentals of grip, stance, and alignment. And that's, those are the three real things that you're, you're talking about during the pre-shot routine to make sure they'll have success during the, the regular shot. I teach that to my beginners. I teach them right off the bat to say, look, you really need to find... Um, uh, your way of getting this routine, but to make sure that you're not questioning yourself. A lot of times people who get before that first swing, and is my left hand right? And if you're asking that, there's no way you're going to be able to execute a golf swing. Right, right. Now, you mentioned that the grip could be individual. The pre-shot routine, I'm sure in your 30 years of working as a pro, you've seen some pretty unique pre-shot routines. Can you talk about any specific that might come to mind that... (laughs) Some I can't mention, um, <laughs> uh, you know, but I can tell you that uh, an interesting um, thing that was done years ago is there was a time study done on different tour players in their pre-shot routine. Greg Norman was 24 seconds. Nick Price was 18 seconds. They did find that if those tour players had the same amount of time for the routine, they played their best golf. But if they varied to 21 seconds to 24 seconds, it really wouldn't be that much. It would be one second that was a problem so we are creatures of habit but Mm -hmm. yeah i've I've had some people that you know they uh, you know they have to clear their throat before they do it or you know there's this big stretching exercise (laughs) um i had one person who you know would would take so long that i don't know how they could do it but a lot of different uh little niches but um you know it's uh it is an individual thing and uh, uh people should take the time to practice it so then we move into the swing from the pre shot routine how integral is it to get your swing to just a point where you don't even have to think about it anymore and how do you do that well the theory is and it, it's it's been proven that a proper setup all those things we talked about setup right. will lead to the proper swing and really um once the particularly the posture if it's set up correctly and you get the person just getting the feeling of you know turning a little to the right side and then just going to the finish and, and, you know, taking someone and putting them in a balanced finish position where, the, you know, the front foot is flat and the back foot is turned up so it's on the toe and the back knee is touching the front leg and the person's turned right around to the target. That's really what people should be focusing on, not how to get there, but that's the position. And then athletically, from your good setup, find a way to get there. So the swing is, um, you know... Uh, there's a lot of different theories out there. Some people believe, and again, it depends on the person. I may have a person, depending on their style of learning, if they learn by feel, then it's going to be feel. If they're more visual, then I'm going to show them. Or if they're more uh, intellectual, then they need more of a mechanical approach to it. There are people that do that excel that way. So as a teacher, you've got to kind of find out how this person's learning process is. But I try to keep it... Um, there's not that many mechanical people out there that, that really can perform an athletic function. I mean, uh, you know, it is about reacting to a target. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, it's like if, uh, if some of the people listening recall back in uh, the Yankees when they were playing the Red Sox and Chuck Knobloch was on second base, and he was having the darndest time trying to throw the ball. Mm-hmm. Well, they showed him in slow motion, and he was watching his hand throw the ball. You can't athletically watch your mechanics or think about your mechanics and react. All you had to do was just throw it to the glove, that kind of thing. So mm-hmm. it's tough to be mechanical. But uh, the swing itself, you know, I really think um, I try to get people just to understand what a balanced finish is, what it's like to feel that, and then find the way that, for a balanced move to get back and through uh, and let them, um, you know, get to that target. Talk a little bit about the importance of the path of the club so that they can get the ball on line at the same time. And, and maybe I like to have fun teaching beginning students how to hit the ball with different types of curves at will just by changing the stance and the grip a little bit. It makes them better players a lot faster. Is there such a thing as a post-shot routine? A post-shot routine? <laughs> I've heard crying. I've heard a lot of things. <laughs> but you know, yelling, uh, screaming. I've seen clubs go in lakes. I've yeah, seen a lot yeah. of things. <laughs> but uh, generally... Uh, you know, Barbara Rotella, who's just an amazing uh, sports psychologist, he, he really coaches most of the, the people on tour. 
always says it the best. There should be no emotion up or down. It should be kind of even keel. You can smile and be happy, but don't jump for joy or don't get very mad because that's going to affect your round right. and affect you know the next shot. So it is important to keep somewhat of a positive attitude because you know every hole is a new opportunity, right? Absolutely, <laughs> and it's, it's, it's a. You know, you can have a bad hole but make a birdie the next hole. And you know what? You may make another birdie the next hole. If if you're thinking what you're doing on each hole, then really, you know, I'm worried about that, then you don't ne- you know, the number can be whatever it is. All you can control is one shot at a time. And don't worry about your score. You just try to take that shot as just the only thing you're doing in that moment. You're in that moment. And then you're just trying to execute that to the very best of your ability. You plan it out, you you prepare for it, and then you just execute it. And then you go to the ball and you plan the next one because you can't do anything about the last one and you certainly can't control the future. And that's the zone. Right, right. Now, I, that's a perfect segue into discussing something about the mental game of golf. Is there anything we can do to condition ourselves um, that you have found s- successful in your many years of working with many different levels to condition ourselves to play an even keel. Yeah, you know, I think you have to understand yourself first. Um, and, and, you know, you got to understand what you can and cannot control. Um, it's okay to be a fiery, temporary kind of player. That's your personality. That's what's going to work. Your swing's going to show that. It's okay to be a very laid-back, quiet person. You can still be successful. But, you know, you can't do things that you're not. Um, I think um, one of the important things to do, is you need to, to, to make it your goal to become confident in what you do. And that means you've got to be afraid to take a risk. You've got to be afraid to hit a shot that you hate. You know, you know But... I think uh, one of the things that helps set up is I'd like to see my students play more than practice. I like to see them practicing their putting, their chipping, and their tee shots about 20% of the time. A little bit of practice with the irons, but I like to see them play as much as possible because if you get too stuck on the on the practice tee about you know hitting the ball, and we all will do it, you start to get mechanical. When you go on the golf course, you hit one back shot, you're almost ready to go back to, to practice. Mm. You can't finish the round. You've got to go out there and be able to play good golf when you hit the ball lousy. You know, when you're not hitting it, it's best, but you know you're, you're putting and chipping is doing great that day, or you're hitting one good shot, one, and, and next thing you know, the score is you're hitting terribly, and it's one of the best scores of your life. That can happen. Um, I think it's just outlook, you know, is that to realize that it's 18 holes, it's a whole game. Um, you know, it's just—it's not something done by one shot. I, I look. I know people that they learn to play well and relax because they put a headset on a half hour before and they listen to classical music. Mm. Uh, some people—it's uh, nothing more than having to walk around the parking lot four or five times. It's really getting to know yourself and how you can get to that point to hit that one shot at a time and do it, knowing that you know how to do it and with confidence. Because you, mentally, you... It, it gets better. Right, and that equipment is not inexpensive, so you don't want it to end up in the lake every single time you no, play. No, I, I saw that happen <laughs> once, and I didn't, I didn't mean to laugh, but it was probably one of the funniest things I've ever seen in my life. So, um, I, I, just, I was just flabbergasted. All of a sudden, with no emotion, the man hit a golf ball, and it hooked and went into the lake, and he just went over and put the club in the bag. And he, well, he's taking the clubs off the car. I thought he was going to walk away or something, and he just took it and tossed it right in the middle of the lake, <laughs> and then walked in. And it was a funny day. Oh, well. We've been talking about it for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Makes for <laughs> good stories. Kind of clubs, so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, that's true. Okay, let's talk about fitness and what we can do to uh, get our physical selves. We've got our mental selves all in gear, what do we need to do to, what do the best golfers do to train physically for the game? And, you know, ultimate, ultimately, what what can we do to be prepared to play our best game of golf? Well, that's changed over the years, too, because, mm-hmm. um, you know, the stories I heard from a lot of tour players in the 50s and 60s was it was to see who could stay out the latest, drink the most, and shoot <laughs> the best score the next day. But the players today, just the reason why they hit the ball so well and they play so much better is they're really very fit. It starts with, uh, starts with nutrition. Um, you know, they keep themselves hydrated. They try to eat the right foods. They stay in good shape. 
but a lot of stretching uh, and a lot of you know there's various weight programs out there. But um, there are golf specific uh, ex- you know weight programs now and things to do. Um, there's a lot of golf specific training trainers out there, physical therapists. Um, but I think you know for everybody uh, just who wants to do it, just get into a good stretching program. Um, and there's some good golf-specific stretching things. Uh, you want to make sure you stretch your triceps, your shoulders. You want to stretch the hamstrings. Uh, you want to stretch, you know, uh, the muscles on the side and, and, and various muscles. Um, uh, you don't want to do a lot of heavy lifting. You don't want to bulk up. So Nautilus is probably better. Strength training is, is probably a lot better than, you know, trying to do any power lifting because at some point then you're going to restrict you know, the natural movements of the swing. But there are, there are uh, pre-season, in-season, and off-season, um, you know, training and exercises that people can do, and there's a lot of different uh, trainers out there that, that do it. That certainly is going to give you a chance for optimum performance. Um, and the other thing is some type of walking or cardiovascular. You know, you want to keep moving, um, and it's great to walk with this game too, so don't forget to walk mm. and, uh, or run and jogging. Uh, running, uh, you know, can be a little hard sometimes in the knees and shins, so it depends on the individual, but, you know, the, it's okay to play other sports. It used to be a theory, ah, oh, you can't swim or do this. It's whatever type of um, physical activity you can have, first off, just for your overall well-being is great, but sure. I just think it, it does help golf, too, and, you know, you want to keep the muscles um, relaxed, but you also want them to be, able to be active so that they can really react and give you all the strength you can have. Do you think the uh, f- fitness or training for golf varies uh, between men and women? Do you think there's any anything women should do? There's certain basics, but I think you know that certainly gender-wise, there's going to be different different things. And again, you seek out a, a, a teaching professional who can really probably get you to the right physical person to help the individual in your area. Okay. Well, let's go back to to instruction. Uh, what what are some of the important things to consider before you actually decide to work with a pro to t- try to improve your game? Well, I think, um, you know, they're, they're, uh, first off, gender is maybe something for, there are a lot of females who, who really, you know, maybe don't feel comfortable with a male teaching them, and that's why they've stayed away from that. So, you know, there's a lot of great female teachers out there. Sure. Um, on the other hand, though, you know, we have a female professional here at the ranch, uh, head professional Hope Kelly, and you know what? Uh, she teaches male, females, and juniors. She's just an, an incredible instructor. So, you know, you got to just feel comfortable with the person. Um, people in an area will hear of someone who's good or not, and, uh, you know, um, they'll, word of mouth is probably the, the professional's best advertising. Um, but, you know, you may have somebody that you take a lesson with and you don't feel all that comfortable. doesn't mean they're not a bad person. It's just that, you know, maybe it doesn't click. Don't give up. There's others out there. And you can always call your local PGA section and uh, or you go on site onto PGA.com to find a local professional. But what do you think makes a good instructor? Good listener, someone who's patient, someone who likes to have fun. Uh, who knows how to make other people comfortable and is not afraid to serve other people um, and make you feel like, you know, when you're there, that person is there for you. Uh, and, and, you know, just is willing to, to take the time to ask the right questions to make sure that, you know, that person feels comfortable and understands what's happening. Now, do golfers tend to come in, you know, newer golfers, and just expect really quick success and really, you know, easy and and have you actually had, first of all, let me just ask, do you have any success stories where, where anyone just kind of walked in and took a lesson and was a really great golfer? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've had a lot of people. I used to do, um, you know, there's a lot of times I'll give a lesson and, you know, it's, it's over in, in eight swings because it just goes back to the basics and people forget the ball's out of position. And, you know, I've had many times someone come to the tee in the morning and they're ready to play a tournament. So you got to look at me hitting so bad and, you know, they'll go out and win and play really well. Um, I had one young lady that, uh, when I was on the Cape at the captain's, um, you know, uh, she and her boyfriend came down, and she took her first series of lessons, and, you know, I heard from her dad a couple weeks ago, and this is probably seven or eight years ago, you know, and she shot her first even par round of golf. So, you know, uh, to go from a beginner to that, 
uh, it, it's just it's incredible. Now, is there a certain amount of natural ability there, or do you attribute it to your excellent instruction? I think it's a combination of both. I think uh, particularly with that one individual, it was um, a lot of determination. Certainly there was physical ability. There were no physical limitations. Uh, but, you know, she struggled at first like every golfer would, but she got hooked by the bug, and she practiced those things that were basic. And I remember a couple of years ago, she was here for a, a tournament that, that was a little tour that came here, and um, we worked, and I gave her a lesson. And, uh, you know, she, all those basics, she remembered them, and she was just sticking with them, and so she had confidence in what she's doing, and, but she took the time to, to practice a little bit and play better. Well. There's hope for all of us. Oh, now. <laughs> absolutely. You know, the thing is, is um, we can't all aspire to be the best uh, player that ever lived, but we all aspire to do the best that we can do. And whatever that level is, providing when you're off the golf course at the end of 18 holes, you feel more energized and more relaxed than when you started, then you're playing the game the right way. And if you get off the golf course and you feel exhausted and you feel like you, every bone in your body aches and you're not playing golf, because golf was, was really intended for a sport against, uh, you know, to be able to compete against other people, but the person against, you know, a task or an element. And it's, uh, if you do it too hard, you overthink it, you're going to be exhausted. So you can kind of tell at the end of the round if you're doing it right or not. And uh, the big thing is, is, you know, once in a while and you're out there and you've hit a bad shot, but there's, uh, you know, a beautiful patch of wild roses to your left, just walk over and take a smell. It's, mm. uh, it's kind of neat. That's a nice thought. And, you know, golf courses can be some of the most beautiful places in the world. So why don't we talk about some of your top courses to visit? Well, the Ranch Golf Club uh, certainly is is one of the best. Uh, It's an incredible, uh, ever-changing golf experience. Um, It has lynx holes. It has holes carved out to the woods, the traditional New England tile holes, and it has a couple of holes with tremendous, you know, great elevation changes. uh, A couple of par fives with 120 and 160 foot elevation drops. So, and overlooking a a small mountain range. So you think you're in, uh, you know, in in Colorado at some point. Mm. But it's just a beautiful, beautiful experience. Um, There are many great courses in New England that I've played. I wouldn't miss any, but to say, but uh, I go. I spent 10 years on Cape. Cod and, you know, Eastwood Ho, which is called Pebble Beach of the uh, East, and uh, Hyannis Port and uh, Oyster Harbors. Those are all tremendous golf courses. You go on to the islands and, you know, Sankety Head. And I, I tend to, to really uh, like those older, more traditional courses, the Donald Ross designs. Uh, the new ones are nice and they're beautiful. And Nantucket Golf Club is fantastic. It's gorgeous. But Sankety Head has the, 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 the you know, the the lighthouse there, and it's just really a wonderful charm. Um, Farm Neck, uh, they have, uh, which is on uh, Martha's Vineyard, great golf course, the one that President Clinton would play all the time when he was mm-hmm. over there in the summer. Uh, Newport Country Club, which is going to be the site of the Women's Open here uh, in a few weeks down in Newport, Rhode Island, is amazing. Um, boy, Myopia Hunt Club in, in um, Essex County Club. The Country Club in Brookline, one of the best in the world. Down the coast a little bit, uh, I've played, uh, uh, I want to say Seminole, which is in North Palm Beach, Florida. is is another Donald Ross built in the 20s, but that's probably one of the the, the best golf courses I've played. Mid-Ocean, which is in Bermuda, is another beautiful golf course I've played. Casa de Campo in the Dominican Republic. Mm. Um, I want to get on a plane and go back to these. (laughs) I know. There's also a new place opening up that's really pretty incredible. Uh, That's down in uh, Jersey City, which is right um, on the shore overlooking the Statue of Liberty called Liberty National. That will be opening up this year. I'm sure people are going to hear a lot about it. Very exclusive, but just an amazing place. But um, I've toured that when it was in construction. It is pretty pretty special. Wow, that's cool, but, being able to see the Statue of Liberty while you're oh, playing golf. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah. It, you, there's no other, and Manhattan. I mean, it's just that you've never seen anything like it. It's pretty amazing. Wow, that's exciting. What What do you think makes for a challenging golf course? Well, it, there's two kinds of challenging courses. One is um, manufactured, and that's probably where I really get bored, and I don't have a fun day with that. Um, when, when, you know, unfortunately, for one reason or another, you know, whatever land the architect had to work with was, was pieced in, so they had to, you know, kind of piece it in between something and create a lot of target golf. And while it's fun, you know, I, I don't, that doesn't really appeal to my senses, as would be, 
a golf course that's laid out on natural terrain uh, without a lot of movement and, and you know, just well-placed bunkers, um, you know, good, uh, really difficult green complexes where you've got to really use your imagination to chip and putt and, um, you know, good length but yet excellent conditioning. You hear a lot about places like Pinehurst in North Carolina as being a, a good place to get uh, really good instruction and maybe stay for a week and do you know some really good intensives. Um, are there other places that you can talk about where um, training facilities might be superior in this country? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I know that um, PGA National down in Port St. Lucie has one of the finest practice facilities and great PGA instructors there. There's several great places in Florida. Um, in the summertime, I know you have uh, uh, many golf schools around in, in the New England area, in the northern area, um, instructional schools, uh, the Harmon schools, which are now, uh, I know there's, there's one outside of Boston and there's a couple other places. Um, those are great. Um, Really, I think if you get on the internet, you can, it's just there's so much out there uh, that offers schools um, that it wouldn't be very hard for someone to find something they'd like. I think the thing is, is you know, make it fun, add it, in, but make sure it's a vacation too, right. not just right. I'm going to go learn golf because those weeks people come back so frustrated they end up having to take a lesson they get back just to straighten them out. Make it a vacation, fun time, and so if you're going to go to Pinehurst, what a great place to go! It's a history of golf, you know. Uh, the Donald Ross is. Uh, uh, course there, number two, and the courses he did there, they're all beautiful. Or if you go to Florida, you know, enjoy the beach or enjoy something, but make it a fun time, too. Now, a lot of uh, golfers really enjoy sitting down and watching the game of golf on television or even, you know, going to a, a PGA tournament um, to watch. What what can we learn as, as golfers from the pros um, in watching them play? Oh, uh, particularly, you have to go in person. Watch how they swing with such ease. Hmm. Don't watch the ball as much. Watch their balance. Watch their grips. Watch their mannerisms. And then copycat the things that they did the same that you thought, wow, I, if I do that. Unfortunately, people just want to see how far they can hit the ball. We know they can hit the ball far. But watch their posture. Watch their ball position. Watch their tempo and, and the ease in which they swing to hit, you know, uh, a seven iron, you know, 175, 180 yards with no effort. That's really, uh, those are really the things that people should watch is get impressed with. And, and, and you know, what, what is the mannerism on the golf course, you know, and, and, and how do they handle emotionally hitting a bad shot? And, you know, how do they handle it being in a difficult situation but pulling off a great shot? Those kind of things. How about the future of golf? Are there uh, are there new innovations that are, say, increasing, like the length that we can hit the ball? You know, the, is there something in golf that's that's really changing that you can see um, will change the game? Well, you know, there's limits to that because of the USGA and because if you make equipment that everything is greater and greater, then all the golf courses we have will be obsolete. <laughs> and, you know, there's some great golf courses, and they've been around for hundreds of years. And I think we still have to limit what it's going to do as far as how far you can hit the ball and what kind of aid. Because, you know, if you're the true golfer wants to do it the right way, they want to do it fair, they don't want a gimmick to make them hit it better, yeah, they'll use a little help for, from equipment if it's if it's within the rules. And that's the beauty of the game, it's within the rules. Um I just see that, uh, you know, golf courses continuing to offer, you know, good conditions, uh, all golf courses for, for any level of play. And, um, you know, we certainly, uh, access is an important um, issue uh, so that people can have access. Not everybody has tremendous means to join a private club or whatever. Uh, so we want to keep it as affordable as possible. Um, people keeping in great condition. And, you know, you can only play basketball or tennis or a lot of sports for so long. You can play golf till you're 95 years old. That's right. It's a great sport and for lifetime. And it does lifetime. still, it, it, it is probably still one of the most addictive sports for your competitive juices that there is. I mean, Michael Jordan even said, he said, golf's just one of the hardest games I've ever played. It just makes you come back and want to get better. So I think the game will be healthy for a long, long time. Um, I think uh, in the short term, what's exciting is what's happening with the women's tours, Michelle Wees, the Paula Kramers, and 
these gals are just, you know, they they can play. They can play with the guys, and you know they're they're good looking, they're sexy, and and they're just gonna, you know, they are Madison Avenue's answer to you know what some people might find boring about golf. Well, there's also really cute golf clothes for women. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and that's exciting uh, to me. Yeah, you know the game is is growing up, you know, and um, it, it is embracing the masses, and you know we're, I think. While we are traditional, certainly we're not the same we were 100 years ago. So things will always change and, and evolve, and I think, uh, you know, get to where, where people will enjoy it. And um, But, you know, people need to feel comfortable, but I do like I do like what's happening, you know, in, uh, in women's golf. And, you know, uh, women's golf gets stronger, more guys are going to play, and the game's just going to keep growing. So if you had, if, if you had a, a client who came to you for a lesson, getting ready to play in a big tournament next week, what would be, and, and they just wanted, you know, a basic lesson that would, you know, really sharpen their skills and go out there and play the best game of golf they've ever played. What what would be the points, the key points that you would try to go over with them? Yeah, I wouldn't hit many balls, uh, particularly going into um, a tournament. I would hit, uh, you know, some some uh, drivers and some mid irons and a couple of shorter irons, just checking ball position, uh, reminding that person, you know, this club, the ball needs to be a little bit more here than this one. You got it a little too far up, a little too far back. Just check on that. Uh, you know, is, are you comfortable with your routine? Are you visualizing and all that? And then I'd spend really most of the time uh, really working on the putting and the chipping and the pitching. Lob shots, generally the shots that people have a hard time with are 50 yards and in, and just, just work on them until the person feels like they're very confident they have the feel for the distance. Are there certain shots that people typically will make, you know, you hear of the dog leg right, and how, how do you correct those, those slices? The slice is the one that curves away from your front of your body. The hook is the one that curves towards uh, around your body. Um, that could be um, one of a couple of things. I generally start with that, with grip. The club face somehow is starting the ball out and doing that. I then look at alignment and stance, but that goes to part of that, that check routine of, of, um, of that. But you have to hit one or the other to, to a small degree. You really can't hit the ball straight. To be a good player, you have to work the ball with a curve, be it you know, a slice or a fade, uh, or a hook, a fade or a hook, but you just don't want it to be extreme. So, you know, you have to find out as a player which style is yours and learn how to, to work those shots. And, you know, uh, examples, Lee Trevino, Jack Nicholas typically faded the golf ball, which you would call a slice. Uh, on the other hand, you know, a lot of your players hit the ball right to left, Sam Snead and a lot of these younger players, and they hook it. Um, so you're trying to work, be able to work the ball either way. You never, you know, so if a person's a little off, then it's, it's probably just a little adjustment in grip or ball position or, you know, setup. It's, it, and of course, that makes the swing feel funny, but I wouldn't go fixing the swing for that. Now, how about the club choice? Um, you, you actually worked as a caddy. Are, are there, do people actually make mistakes in club choices these days? Oh, absolutely. I think everybody, and unfortunately, the day of the caddy is not as big as it was when I was a young boy because they'd have caddies at public golf courses, and a good caddy is going to save you half a dozen shots around. There's no doubt about it because, you know, ego gets into the game. Sure. And um, uh, you know, somebody will uh, uh, certainly um, think they can hit at that 7 nine, 150 yards, but there's a 20-mile-an-hour wind in their face, and it's uphill, and... Um, uh, you know, they really should be using a five iron. So, yeah, you can make mistakes. And a caddy who, is, who knows the player is certainly going to help that player make better decisions um, and calm them down and bring them back. Uh, you know, you speak about clubs, too. A lot of times that fade of that hook could be the fitting of the golf club, too. So be your own caddy. In, in, in many <laughs> ways, yes. You know, you be realistic about what you're trying to do and what you can do. Well, Michael Robichard, thank you so much for all your valuable information. It makes me want to get out on the course today. Well, I hope this so. beautiful because, day. Uh, we, need, we need all the golfers, and uh, it's been my pleasure. It's a lot of fun to talk about it. And for more information about the Ranch Golf Club, we can contact you at your website. You want to give us that web address? Certainly. Uh, www.theranchgolfclub, all spelled out with no spaces, dot com. 
And you also have a uh, toll-free number? Toll-free number is 866-790-9333. And we look forward to uh, seeing everyone up here. Great. Well, we will see you at the 19th hole. Thank you. (laughs) Bye, Michael. Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye. We hope you've enjoyed this discussion about the great game of golf and that you'll get out there, work on your game, and most of all, enjoy your time on the course. For more information about the Ranch Golf Club in Southwick, Massachusetts, you can call 1-866-790-9333 or visit their website at www.theranchgolfclub.com.